Hello and welcome students, faculty, and staff. Uh, my name is Hannah Jackson. I am a sophomore in the Elliott School of International Affairs, and I'm the president and founder of GW Young Black Professionals in International Affairs. I would first like to thank, personally thank each of our guests for lending us a portion of your evening to attend our panel discussion um, tonight, moderated by DC diplomat in residence, Yolanda Kearney, on fellowships to a career in diplomacy. Um, I'd now like to give a bit of background about our organization and, and why we are here today. Um, Young Black Professionals in International Affairs is a student organization founded in July of 2020, committed to increasing and amplifying African and African diaspora perspectives in both the Elliott School of International Affairs and the field of international relations overall through mentorship, community, and professional and academic development. We have a mission of creating and sustaining a pipeline of, 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 of Black students and in future international affairs practitioners while also recognizing that there may be holes in that pipeline. And thus we aim to provide a network resources and, and support um, to bridge those gaps. Um, in accordance with the goal of, of Young Black Professionals in International Affairs, we are hosting these, this event today, um, not only to expose African-American students of pursuing international relations to the myriad of, of career pathways there are within the field, but also help such students uh, navigate the fellowship opportunities um, that there are along the way. Um, today, we will hear, for, hear from uh, past and current fellows of the Thomas R. Pickering Foreign Affairs Fellowship, the Charles B. Rangel Fellowship, the Foreign Language and Area Studies Fellowship, and the USA Donald M. Payne Fellowship about how their specific programs have shaped their career trajectory and molded them into the career professionals they are today. I would also like to thank our colleagues at the GW Center for Career Services for helping us promote this event, the Elliott Alumni Relations uh, Department for securing some of our panelists and our incredible events team members and organization executive board for helping uh, plan this event um, and execute this event as well. Um, a few housekeeping items before we begin. Um, we ask that you please keep all microphones off for the duration of the event. We will have a 10 minute um, Q&A from the audience moderated by our events team member, Kelsey Cotts um, at the end of the discussion, but please feel free to put any questions in the chat um, ha as you have them. Um, lastly, we, we would like to preference and acknowledge that all things said today are the panelists' individual views and opinions and do not reflect or represent the State Department, United States government, or their fellowship programs. Um, I, would allow, I would now like to introduce our moderator for tonight, uh, Dr. Yolanda Kearney. Dr. Kearney joined the United States Diplomatic Corps as a Foreign Service Officer in 2004. She served as a counselor for public affairs at the U.S. Embassy, in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, and a public affairs officer at the U.S. Mission to Barbados in the Eastern Caribbean Organization of Eastern Caribbean States. She also served as a public affairs officer at the U.S. Embassy in Jamaica, a cultural affairs officer at the U.S. Embassy in the Republic of Cameroon, and an economic officer and chief counsel at the U.S. Embassy in the Republic of Guinea. She's a recipient of several Department of State uh, Meritorious Honor and Superior Honor Awards and the Lois Roth Award for Excellence in Cultural Diplomacy. Dr. Kearney is a proud alumna of Howard University from which she earned undergraduate, graduate and doctoral degrees in music history and literature and religious studies. Before joining the Foreign Service, she served as a music historian at the United States Library of Congress. It is now my absolute pleasure and honor to welcome Dr. Yolanda Kearney and turn the floor over to her. Thank you so much, Hannah, for not only that lovely introduction, but also for all the work that you are doing in this space in international affairs. I couldn't be prouder of you and just look forward to having you as a colleague uh, sooner rather than later. So this evening, we're gonna talk a little bit about three of the four diplomatic fellowships. The three that we're discussing this evening uh, are uh, two at the State Department, the Pickering and Wrangell Fellowships, and then one at USAID, the Payne Fellowship. The third, which is, uh, the fourth rather, which is structured similarly, but we won't be discussing tonight, is the Foreign Affairs IT Fellowship, which is in the State Department, structured very much like Pickering and Wrangell, but it is for specialists, foreign service specialists rather, 
rather than officers. So this evening, we're going to hear from fellows. We're gonna talk a little bit about what it means to be in this space, the international affairs space, uh, coming to it as women of color and black women in particular. We're gonna talk a little bit about their preparation for the fellowships, and they have some words of wisdom for you and also for me. So with that, I'd like for each of our uh, fellows to first introduce themselves, tell us a little bit about your fellowship, uh, and give us a, a one word snapshot of what your fellowship is. So uh, ladies, you're in different different areas on my screen, but uh, why don't we start with Shaniqua? Oh, good evening, everyone. My name is Shaniqua Nelson. I'm a Charles B. Wrangell International Affairs graduate fellow, originally from Durham, North Carolina. Um, I got my BA and MA um, in political science from Howard University, and I got an additional MA in um, global communications from GW. So I'm so excited to be here today. Um, one of the words that I would use to describe the Wrangell Fellowship is just truly transformative. Um, the Wrangell Fellowship, just simply put, uh, prepares young people for a career in the Foreign Service, and they utilize a holistic approach. So they prepare young people educationally by uh, providing them with funding for graduate school, uh, professionally by providing them with two um, internships, one domestic on the Hill and one international at one of the um, U.S. Um, consulates, uh, embassies, or missions around the world. And socially, um, they prepare, prepare young people by providing them um, with just a strong cohort and um, just people that they can connect with um, as they matriculate um, as future foreign service officers. Um, and I say that the program is transformative just be because it um, just gives a young person everything that they need um, to prepare them for a career in the foreign service. Thank you for that. You know what? I'm gonna just skip around a little bit. Let's hear from our uh, Payne Fellow. Hi everyone. Uh, thank you so much for having me. My name is Ashley Hamilton. I am your Payne Fellow tonight. Um, and so I, I completed my bachelor's degree at Spelman College in Atlanta, Georgia. So I'm also an HBCU graduate. Um, I completed my master's at Georgetown University in the Global Human Development Program. So um, if I had to choose one word to describe my fellowship, Shaniqua stole mine. I was going to originally say transformative, but I will say that um, my follow-up adjective would be thrilling. Um, and I say that because every step of this entire process has been so exciting. It's been an opportunity to stretch myself beyond my boundaries, to work on some of the world's most pressing issues um, in really important ways and to make a significant difference in the world. So um, overall, my experience so far has been thrilling and I anticipate that the rest of my career will be in a similar vein. Thank you so much, Ashley. So for folks who are learning about the fellowships, you, if you're keeping up, we have covered um, Wrangell, we've covered Payne, and now let's talk about Pickering. Hi everyone, my name is Victoria Giordano Latortu. Um, I'm a Thomas R. Pickering Fellow. I was a graduate fellow. Um, and both Shaniqua and Ashley um, described them for the fellowships well, but I would say critical. Um, critical because these fellowships are very important to the State Department, but they're also essential to our development as foreign service officers. I did my undergraduate degree at NYU and my master's at George Washington University, which um, these fellowships allow students to seek a higher degree at one of the top 10 foreign policy schools. And that's very important um, when you get into the foreign service. Also, uh, the Pickering Fellow, similar to Wrangell and Payne, has the opportunity for you to do internships. Our internships are a little different. Um, with Pickering, I spend one internship at what we call Main State, which is the State Department headquarters in Washington, DC. And then one internship overseas at a US embassy. And both of those taught me skills that I use today as a foreign service officer, skills that many of my colleagues didn't have when they entered the foreign service. 
and skills that foreign service officers even get taught in training. So these were critical in my development to basically put me almost a step ahead when I enter the foreign service and give me a higher education, which contributes to my success in the foreign service. So these ladies have outlined the structure of the fellowships and they've uh, really highlighted what's interesting and um, most critical about them. The first is that they are internships. There are internships, uh, two internships that are um, critical and part of each of the fellowships. So for um, pain for USAID and for um, Pickering, it's at your headquarters in Washington, DC, and then at an embassy or a consulate abroad. For Wrangell, it's at your, um, it's at, uh, with a member of Congress, and then at an embassy or a consulate abroad. So there's an internship component to the two years of graduate study. The fellowships also cover the cost of graduate school, which I don't know about you, but not paying for grad school is always a sweet, um, a sweet notion. So finally, it uh, leads to employment. So it's internship, it um, is uh, mentoring along the way, and then graduate study along with those internships, between the summers of those internships, and then finally, it leads to employment. So ladies, with those distinctions, tell us how you chose to apply for each of those um, fellowships and how you, how you made the decision. Shaniqua, why don't we start with you? I had the opportunity um, a couple of years ago to um, work at US Embassy um, Beijing in China. And one thing I noticed was everybody that I truly admired as foreign service officers, they were either Wrangell or Pickering fellows. Um, so um, I knew that I wanted um, to um, join the foreign service. And I was just like, I want to mimic some of those people that I see, all the people that I truly admire, they're Pickering and Wrangell, so I'm going to apply to the Pickering and Wrangell Fellowship. Um, and I applied to Wrangell and um, it has just been an amazing um, journey ever since. Um, it's just giving me um, all the tools that I needed to be a successful foreign service officer and I'm just extremely thankful. So um, it's just actually seeing Pickering and Wrangell's in the field just doing amazing things that made me want to apply for the Wrangell Fellowship. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit, Cassidy, about your your um, thought process when you were getting ready to apply? I'm sorry, Ashley. Ashley, sorry. Yes, no worries. Um, so I learned about the Foreign Service and learned that I wanted to be a Foreign Service officer when I was a sophomore in undergrad. And so from there, I knew that I didn't want to go directly into graduate school. So I took some time and became a Peace Corps volunteer. Um, and so once I completed the Peace Corps, I came back to the US, but I had never heard of the Pain Fellowship. And so my sister actually was the one who sent me this fellowship. I checked it out and I'm like, wow, this sounds like a fantastic opportunity. Um, and that's kind of how I got into it. I knew that I wanted to continue in the field of development once I finished the Peace Corps, um, because it was a truly transformative experience. And so I applied for the fellowship that way. I definitely did not know about the fellowship before. And so it's kind of serendipitous how it happened for me. Um, but yeah, that's that's kind of how I got to this point. And Victoria? I, when I applied to the Pickering Fellowship, I did not know too much about the Foreign Service. I was in my junior year of college and I knew I wanted to work in international affairs. Um, I was studying abroad at NYU Abu Dhabi at that time. So as I did more research into careers, I found out about the Foreign Service. I met someone who was working in Dubai at our US consulate there. And she told me about the Foreign Service. She was also a Pickering Fellow and she told me about the fellowship program. And from there, I, you know, I was attracted to the career. I was attracted to the fellowship and uh, getting a higher degree. And also the internship aspect, um, where Pickering and Wrangell fellowships do differ is in our internships. Uh, Wrangell's do one domestic internship at Maine State and then one internship uh, with Congress. Pickering fellows, as I stated earlier, is one overseas and one at Maine State. And I was just more attracted to the idea of doing like one at an overseas embassy and um, that played a part in my calculation to applying to the Pickering fellowship. 
Thank you. So these ladies have talked about the three um, major fellowships that, that the State Department um, has largely focused on when it comes directly to employment. Let's talk now with Cassidy Charles about the FLAS Fellowship. Cassidy, what on earth is FLAS? Tell us your deal. So uh, hi everyone, um, I'm Cassidy, I'm a FLAS fellow and FLAS is a grant by the uh, Department of, US Department of Education actually and it stands for Foreign Language and Area Studies Fellowship and what it is is both an academic year and summer grants that allows undergraduate and graduate students interested in doing intensive uh, language study and area studies. Um, so it, the academic year fellowship pays for your tuition. You have to be really careful about, you know, the school's bylines, of course, but pays for tuition and offers you a $15,000 stipend. And then the summer fellowships allow you to do more language work. So that is that is what FLAS is. And if I had to summarize it in a word, I'd have to say connection, because for me, um, I'm wholly an area studies person. So um, my, my dream sort of tagline is to become like Japan expert or Japan specialist. Um, and pretty much like my, my main thing about, you know, my own studies was to connect what I was learning with my work in like, um, you know, international relations of Asia and international security policy with you know, the things that I was reading in the Japanese news and sort of connecting the two and really being able to go to graduate school and, and learn more about international affairs while also learning the, the terminology in Japanese to understand what the Japanese people were saying about things happening in the world around them. That was super important to me. So before we um, started this session this evening, uh, I'm a recruiter, right? So I was trying to do a little recruitment with Cassidy. Um, she was resisting a little bit, but you bring us to a really interesting uh, part of the job, which is language acquisition and how important mastery of foreign languages is. So first, Cassidy, tell us a little bit about, you, you told us about you know, how you may want to be able to use your language skills and international affairs, but tell us how language acquisition has you know, started to shape that discussion. And then I'd like the other ladies to weigh in on your language training and the importance of language acquisition. Well, I think the best example I can give right now is um, as someone who studies Japan and mostly East Asia, there's so much happening in the news right now about um, what's gonna happen between Japan and Korea because Japan and Korea are two of the United States' biggest allies in East Asia, especially with their military alliances. and these two countries not getting along is significant for the United States posture in Asia. And my sort of um, historical and contemporary work has focused around, well, what is, what is keeping them from cooperating together? And to really understand what everyone is talking about, you know, uh, sort of locally, it really comes down to language. Like there, there's a lot in the in apologies that have been given by the Japanese government that um, the Korean government and even Korean citizens find, you know, inexcusable or a little lacking. The Japanese feel a little disrespected because in Korean they consistently use the word king to represent the emperor, and that becomes a big point of contention. So language acquisition suddenly becomes a matter of foreign policy. It becomes a matter of diplomacy. Like you have to understand why using the same phrase over and over, we humbly regret our sorrowful actions, you know, even though it might sound really, you know, stilted to us in English, you know, the words people are using and picking throughout years and years of, of, of conversation comes to be important, especially as, you know, uh, governments change and people still want to go over the same issues and eventually leading to like a breakdown even in economic relations and possibly like, you know, a breakdown in case of a military conflict. So language acquisition is so important to understand what the people around you are saying, what they're feeling. And instead of interpreting that from, you know, my United States based English sense, I can really get into like, okay, like the Japanese, uh, you know, officer with the maritime self-defense forces thinks that the imperial flag is a symbol of pride. And why is that? Because, you know, of the, of the history of, of his country. Um, so these things are really important. And uh, that's how la language acquisition has really shaped my thinking as I'm, as I'm doing this work. Well, you know, thank you for that. You've spoken really eloquently to not only the issue of, of language acquisition in terms of being able to communicate 
on a linear basis, but also the cultural aspects of how you master that language. Shaniqua, Ashley, Victoria, any other thoughts about your language training and the importance of language acquisition? Sure, I'll, um, I'll speak a bit. Um, so I am going to learn my second language with the State Department and that'll be the third language I learn overall, or probably the third or fourth. Um, but so in undergraduate and graduate school, I studied Arabic. And before I went to my first post in Algeria, I spent about 30 to 35 weeks in intensive French training. And I'm about to start a similar duration program for Hebrew because I'm going to Tel Aviv next. And as a political officer, when I was in Algiers, language was very important to doing the job of a diplomat because as a political officer, as Algeria was undergoing political change and transition, um, the government wants to know what's happening and what people are saying. So when you know the language in that country, you know, you go beyond what people in DC can read. You know, they can Google and go on the local newspapers that are in English and everything, and they can get their information there. But what they can't get are what like members of political parties are saying who might not speak English and have to speak French or Arabic. Um, what you know everyday normal society are saying you know whether they're not in political parties or they're not in government so as a u.s diplomat overseas specifically a political officer you got to have those conversations and you know analyze everything you're hearing and report back using those language skills that the department has essentially invested in you any other thoughts ashley shnequa yeah, I'll just say, so specific to USA, so I'm actually about to, I just received my first tour, so I'm about to start my very first language training with USAID. Um, so I can't speak specifically to how the process has been um, on that end, but I can say that I was a, um, I completed a, a temporary duty in Malawi back in 2019, and I can't tell you how many times I've been in a country and even when you can just speak a little bit of the language, how far that takes you with people um, in that country. And so for us, um, for, or for me rather, being in Malawi and having the opportunity to converse and to build connections with um, what we call our foreign service national staff. And so um, within the USAID mission, we have foreign service nationals, people from that country who also work for USAID. And to be able to build those connections with people, uh, primarily just by you know, reaching out and building that bridge by speaking the language makes a huge difference. And this is important because when we think about development at USAID, we always talk about sustainability, right? Sustainability of development results is what's really important because at the end of the day, our job is to work towards self-reliance, right? Um, and not a dependency. So being able to build those connections with our foreign service national staff and colleagues makes all the difference because these are the some of the best and brightest people within the country oftentimes. And so they go on to be political leaders, they go on to be presidents, they go on to be, you know, leaders within their own country. And so to be able to build those connections starts sometimes with just learning a, even a little bit of the language. Very much so. Shanika, I think you're, you are, um, you're muted, but what I'd like you to do, Ashley, you've spoken, brought a really interesting point. Let's talk a little bit about the difference between development and diplomacy as USAID is our lead development agency, state is the lead for diplomacy. Shaniqua, your thoughts on some parallels between uh, development and diplomacy. And then let's circle around and, and see if there's some other thoughts. And forgive me, where folks are coming in anyway, and so that's fine, happy to have you here. Just make sure, please, everyone that you, you mute when you come on in. Sorry. On a very um, basic level, yes, the Department of State you know, focuses on diplomacy and making like US foreign policy and USAID focuses on development policy and program implementation and facilitation change. And um, both of these agencies work together on a, on a lot of different issues and a lot of different things. Um, for, for example, and for example, um, when I served in China, you know, we had a USAID presence there. I mean, we work together 
on a lot of different things. There's definitely differences, but we have there's there's similarities as well. But I would love to hear other people on the panel's um, thoughts on that as well. Victoria. Sure. Um, so I am not a development expert, so please don't quote me if I say something different than you may hear somewhere else. But um, I'll speak more to like how I see our differences out like at an embassy. So as Shaniqua mentioned, you know, there are many similarities. Um, at least I've met colleagues who work on like similar issues like human rights, gender, women's empowerment, education. And as diplomats, we work on those issues too. But I would say we kind of tackle them from two different angles from to get like pretty in the weeds and give like an example let's say um when i was in algeria i managed a grant so that's still like assistance coming from the state department because usaid will also give grants um i think the amounts might differ my grant was relatively small to what usaid will give to a country um and mine was focused on um lgbt organizations and giving them resources to do their work in country um so my role was somewhat limited because I just made sure, you know, they do their paperwork, they're meeting their objectives, and that's about it. Whereas how I saw some USAID counterparts work in other countries are they're much more enmeshed in the program. Um, they know a lot more about what the program's doing. I think they work closer. And I mean, Ashley, please fill in my gaps when I'm done, <laughs> um, if I'm missing something or getting something wrong. Um, they really get to know the people and in many parts of the country. I mean, as diplomats, like we're probably mostly in the capital and some other areas, but from USAID colleagues get to areas that um, people from State Department, Foreign Service officers from State Department don't always get to go to. And as a result, they get, they have pretty extensive networks that will differ. Um, so they work more in the establishment of the assistance, identifying where assistance can be more effective and playing a larger role, as I said, in that implementation um, than we would at State Department. But instead we might say, you know, hey, this USAID thing, this USAID program did a really great job at changing and maybe pushing through or creating the political space for a certain law to make it through. And then from there, like maybe diplomats would, you know, give talking points to the government, to parliament about this law that has only came through because of political space as a result of a development program from USAID. I want to give you guys a, a real world example from my last post. I just came um, out of three years in Democratic Republic of Congo. And uh, there's a very, very large USAID presence in, in country. That USAID presence is actually larger than any other agency present at post. And so uh, when I first started in the Foreign Service, a very, very wise um, ambassador said to me, don't forget, money follows policy and not the other way around. And so the way that we have um, started to look at it, uh, the, the lead policy agency is state. So in the Congo, uh, we're working very closely with the government at mainlining, you know, mainstreaming rather, uh, children with disabilities into a uh, normal classroom so that they would not be separated. So the policy work, a lot of that uh, rested with uh, public affairs um, because educational and cultural affairs rest in public affairs. So a lot of it was based on ADA language uh, in the United States. So so the larger policy and then looking at the tertiary level of education was coming out of um, out of out of state and uh, public affairs. The um, USAID was working on numeracy and literacy at the primary school level. So it was very much grassroots. It was very much how how is this policy that we've decided on going to be implemented? And so with that, Ashley, I'll give you the last word on USAID and um, and development. Absolutely. I you know, Victoria, you hit the nail on the head. I know you were, you definitely, you covered it exactly. Um, I really like how you mentioned that essentially we are tackling these issues, a lot of very similar issues, just from different perspectives, right? From different points of view. And so um, ultimately, you know, we talk a little bit about the differences, but ultimately, um, both state and aid, we are kind of two prongs in the three pronged approach to national security for the United States. And so you have defense, you have development, um, and you have diplomacy. And so we represent at USA, we represent that development piece of things, but ultimately it all kind of goes back to the same um, goal and mission. Um, and yeah. 
So Cassidy, I know you thought for a moment that I was done recruiting, but I'm not. Uh, so we notice now that when we work on language issues in country, so um, in some countries where there are two, three or four Congo, 57, uh, mother tongues, and then children go off to school and they're going to be educated in perhaps three or four. Uh, we happen to use our FLAS fellows uh, to help with some of that work on both the policy side and boots on the ground. But no pressure, Cassidy, none, none whatsoever. So for each of you ladies, let, can tell me a little bit about how your cohort influenced you and how this helped you in your, in your process during your fellowship. Cassie, why don't we start with you? So my cohort, so to speak, is more of just um, the FLASH fellows who've come before me. Um, the, the ones who, who are in the same year as me, we kind of know each other, but we, we have fellowships for different things. Um, at least in my program, we didn't really meet each other until everyone kind of had to sit down for a lunch randomly. But um, I definitely think that talking to other people who are as invested in, you know, area studies and international relations and language, like hits all of those three things as I am, it really helps to see like, okay, you know, what can I do, you know, that, that ne isn't necessarily, you know, working for the government right off the bat. I'll, I might get there later on, um, but you know, what can I do in the interim? What other skills do I need? What, what do I need to build up while I'm at GW? So um, a lot of my cohort has been like supporting me and I've also been, you know, learning from them in so many ways because I'm, I'm surrounded by amazing people and, you know, talking to people again, like I said, who have, you know, something underlying with you, like some, something about the same interests and talking to them and learning from them like, oh, I didn't know about, you know, agriculture in North Korea. That's pretty cool, you know, or learning about gender issues. Um, so my cohort helps me to grow every day. And um, unfortunately, I absorb things like a sponge when I talk to them. So, you know, once I'm in different areas like this, I can bring up the things that I've learned or they help me contribute, you know, intellectually in places that I wouldn't even expect. So my cohort has been really great for that. Excellent. Victoria, tell us about your cohort, how they prepared you and how they support you. Um, I pick a lot of support. Um, my Pickering cohort and also Wrangell College because we come in about the same time. Um, they're, sorry, excuse my phone. Um, they're basically like my family. Um, I, we started working together, I don't know, like maybe four or five years ago when we first met at orientation. Um, and it was like very humbling to meet other people who, you know, are as passionate about international affairs, are as passionate about the career, like the same career path that you're seeking, um, enthusiastic and excited to be on this journey together because I mean, we started the journey together and we're still going through it together, whether it was when we went to our we enter the foreign service with what they call um, the A100 training, where you basically learn everything. Well, I won't say everything, where you learn the essentials to the foreign service. Um, we went through that together, um, job, bidding, like choosing our positions and everything. So it's been, it's been like a family. And there are people who I came in with in my Pickering Fellowship are some of the people I'm closest with in the foreign service today and people I go to for advice when needed. Um, and also, yeah, support, I mean, because it's, it's a long road, it's a hard road, and you do need that support, and that support is very comforting from people who are going through the same exact thing you're going through, um, especially because sometimes, I mean, I don't know, from my university, like, a lot of people, I went to NYU, and a lot of people chose to stay in New York and do finance, Foreign Service DC was a bit of a different thing, and then even from where I'm from in New Jersey, not many people sought the same career I sought. So I found support in my Pickering colleagues who had you know, similar career aspirations than some of my other friends who chose different paths. Thank you. Similar, um, similar experiences with you, Ashley and Shaniqua, yes? Absolutely. I, I just want to say that the network in the Pain Fellowship is incredible. And even though we are the newer um, fellowship program between Wrangell and Pickering, um, I really commend my cohort members and 
other Payne alumni because we truly lift as we climb. And so my cohort members, my colleagues have been instrumental in providing information about post information, um, bidding strategies, salary negotiations, just the entire gamut of things that one might need to know when starting a new job, a new career. Um, I've been able to lean on these people for support, for advice, um, to be a sounding board. And so you just, you cannot really underestimate how important that is when um, getting into this new career. Thank you. So I want to leave plenty of time for questions, but before we move on to that, I want us to touch on two major issues. The first, um, because as black women in this space, black people and black women in, in this space, there are some really interesting experiences that come along with this fantastic gig. So first, um, because the fellowships can be misunderstood even within the international affairs space, why don't um, Victoria, you first, Ashley and Shaniqua, tell us, you know, tell me about some myth that you may have encountered uh, about your fellowship and how you want to debunk it. And then, and then Cassidy, I know you thought that you were off the hook, but also tell us a little something about them um, that people didn't know about FLAS. So Victoria, why don't we start with you? Sure. Um, so I'm going through my head about which to pick because there's so many. <laughs> um, but I think some of the first ones that myself and my fellow fellows um, came face to face with was people other colleagues, because there are colleagues, um, thinking that, oh, if if you're a person of color, you must be a fellow, um, which is not true because there, some people do not know much about the fellowship programs, um, and they assume that these fellowship programs are just to get people of color into the foreign service, um, that Maybe the requirements aren't as strict when it turns out our requirements are stricter than entering the foreign service um, just because you do it at an earlier date um, than most other people would. Um, and I think we also go through like two more interviews, I think, than you normally would <laughs> for entering like with the FSOT and the oral assessment. Um, so that was first challenging to um, counter because, you know, it's essentially someone's questioning um, your presence and questioning your capabilities. So as fellows, you know, we relied on each other um, and eventually we were able, you know, to say, you know, like, no, you can correct people about, you know, that's not true, that's a myth. Um, these are requirements um, and also to people of color who are not fellows, um, they also correct our fellow colleagues to say, no, I am not a fellow and fellows also recruit, you know, people of all demographics. Thank you for that. I'm gonna um, toss out some of that, that jargon. So to join the foreign service uh, in the traditional route, the first step is to take the FSOT, the Foreign Service Officer Test, after which uh, a group of foreign service officers will review written products, um, their personal narratives and essays, and then uh, you secure an invitation to the FASOA, the Foreign Service Oral Assessment. For fellows, before taking the Foreign Service Officer Test, and yes, they must take and pass the Foreign Service Officer Test, they must take and pass the Foreign Service Oral Assessment, that is some of the mythology, oh, well, you do this program and you don't take the FSOT, but you do, and you go to orals. But before they do that, there is an interview and an application process. So there are sort of two layers of um, whittling down of that, um, of that applicant pool. And I have reviewed and interviewed um, uh, Pickering and Wrangell applicants in the past. So that is before the FSOT and the oral assessment. So when Victoria talks about you know, a more stringent, it's true because first you're whittled down before you go through the FSOT and the FSOA. So Ashley, let's go to, to um, USAID. Um, what are some of the you know, myths that you've encountered about the pain fellowship? The one that I most commonly encounter is that um, because some people are not aware of the Payne Fellowship as a hiring mechanism. So a lot of people will just assume that I'm an intern and it's like, no, I'm, I'm actually like a salaried employee. <laughs> and so I think that's just the biggest thing is that uh, people not really being aware of how 
certain people aren't coming into the agency and, and what that really means. And so we still, I think, have some work to do around um, sensitizing people to the fellowships so that they don't have this misconstrued notion. Absolutely. Shaniqua, thoughts? Definitely. Um, I know that sometimes some people believe that um, fellows aren't quality officers. I know just anecdotally, everyone in my cohort came in with um, proficiency, proficiency in a language. They have done um, um, different types of Peace Corps or Fulbright or the critical language you know, studies. They just done so much prior um, federal government experience, prior, um, prior private sector experience. So we're coming in with a lot of the, a lot of skills um, that are desired um, for the foreign service. So we're coming in as quality officers um, and, we're, and, we're, and we're coming in with, um, with um, just educational experiences to help us excel um, in the foreign service. So those, that's just one of the myths that come up that we're not quality officers when we are. You absolutely are. Um, I am not an alumna of Pickering or Wrangell. Um, some of the strongest officers I've ever managed have been Pickerings and Wrangells. Um, you mentioned foreign language, which is not a requirement to join the foreign service. However, many Pickering and Wrangell fellows do come with language expertise already. So when speaking of language, Cassidy, tell us a little bit about what, what people don't know or get wrong about FLAS. Um, so I would like to say that I'm a little bit thankful that, you know, FLAS, since it's not, um, you know, as intense as any of the State Department fellowships where, you know, people are constantly judging your worth. I, uh, I'm not really sure of any stigma like that, but I think one thing that people should know going into FLAS, especially GW, is that there are not many of us, as one would like to think. and sometimes that can be a very solitary experience. Um, so I think I can count on one hand how many FLAS fellows there were in my year. And I am the only Japanese one that, um, you know, in my year. And it really makes you think like, okay, am I, am I possibly, you know, in a space where I'm gonna have to be the one who has to explain certain things to people. Like I had um, a policy discussion the other day where, you know, we were talking about colonialism and they were like, well, is there a legal basis for colonialism? And I was like, never, never ever will there be a, a legal way to be like, we can subdue you, you know? So um, having those conversations might be a little bit frustrating. And I think even though you are in an, a, a, a field where there are lots of people who may, you know, who you feel a certain kinship with, you still might be an island onto yourself, which is not necessarily a bad thing, but it is something people should be prepared for. So I wanna, um, before we take some questions and we have some already popping up, before we move on, um, Cassie, tell us exactly what FLAS stands for and what agency funds it. So FLAS is the Foreign Language and Area Studies Fellowship and it's funded by the US Department of Education. That works very closely with the Department of State frequently and, and you know, Cassie, I may want to mention that many FLAS fellows go on to join the Foreign Service. So let's talk about, uh, get down to brass tacks, let's talk about being Black women, Black people in this space, in international affairs, in uh, diploma and, uh, diplomatic and development um, spaces. Who'd like to start? I've been in the battle since 2004, about the time you guys were in diapers, so uh, I will let you to just throw it out there. Best and worst, uh, best and worst experience uh, in this in this gig so far. Who'd like to start? Okay, I will. Uh, worst. I was consular chief in uh, Guinea Conakry. Um, that country experienced a coup and a counter coup, and I was responsible for the evacuation of American citizens. No higher calling in the diplomatic corps. Uh, the reason we exist in 197 countries is because there's no place in the world that an American citizen may not find him or herself in peril. And so um, the evacuation, planning it, you know, people's lives in, in literally um, depending on me. And I had uh, a missionary come to the embassy and was really irate because there I was 
And he said, but I want to talk to an American. And so um, I was like, ta-da, you know, it's me. So um, being um, mistaken for, it just, you know, just, I, I see you, intellectually, I see you, but I'm having some cognitive dissonance because you can't really be the, co you know, the consular chief responsible for getting me and my family out of this country. Worst moment ever. Uh, but um, no higher service um, to, to serve American citizens. And the flip side of that is very, very much the same thing. Um, there is no correlation between how many evacuations I've been in, and evacuations are rare, but I've had four in my career, three in my last tour in, um, in DR Congo because of civil unrest. And so when you see those planes land, and people are so grateful to be able to get to safety. There is, um, there's just not really a word for that. Um, there, there isn't a word for that. In addition to all the wonderful programs, I mean, I've, I've selected Fulbrighters to go to the United States and study and had all sorts of wonderful um, cultural exchanges. It's fantastic. But um, sometimes um, some of my colleagues, I mean, the diplomatic corps is no different than the United States. It's, it's a snapshot, it's a microcosm of the United States. And so they're great people. And then there's some, you know, less than great people. And so we continue to have uh, some difficulties in this space being heard. Can Yolanda wear her hair natural? Can, you know, is she going to be um, uh, not assumed to be American? Is she as bright? I've had people ask me if I know anything about a particular topic. I was like, I mean, it's chapter three of my dissertation, but okay. So keeping it real, best and worst. Shaniqua. Okay. Well, one of um, the best things about, you know, being a Black woman um, in the Foreign Service is just being able to share your experience, you know, with others and to sort of unofficially recruit people to think about this. For example, <laughs> yeah, absolutely, Cassie and everybody else in here as well. I remember I worked at US Embassy Belmapon in Belize and we had some young girls from Girls Going Global come in and just to be able to be there with my braids, you know, and my bright colors and I love a bright lipstick, being, able to, being out there and just being able to just, you know, tell people that this is an option, you know, getting paid to represent the U.S. abroad and learning language and learning different cultures, you can do that, you know, and instilling that and young girls as young as like eight or nine was just fascinating and I absolutely love that. Um, probably some of uh, one of my worst experiences um, just it has been some people assuming that because my name is Shaniqua, because I change up my hair every chance that I get, you know, that um, I'm just not, um, I'm not a strong officer. Um, um, and, you know, it's disheartening, but, you know, I always know that, you know, I'm standing on the shoulders of some of the other Black women that have come before me. And, you know, I just try to just do good work and keep it going. Um, and dispel any myths and debunk any things that some people have about Black women, about people named Shaniqua and just different things like that. Um, yeah. Ashley, I know you're headed out to your post, but any thoughts? Absolutely. In this space? Yeah, you both touched on kind of what I wanted to talk about, which is having to walk that thin line and like do that balancing act of showing up as your authentic self but still showing up in a way that other people still consider professional, right? And so thinking about what's considered professional in a workplace like USAID or in the State Department um, and how my identity lines up with that and in some ways how it doesn't align with that. So for me, I think the most challenging part about being a Black woman is having to do that balancing act of showing up as my authentic self without you know, stepping too far outside of the boundaries of what it means to be professional. But I think that on the other hand, for me, it's really rewarding to bring my experiences and my perspectives as a Black woman to a place, to a space like the um, like USAID and be able to identify some of the places where we still need a little work to be able to identify some of the places where, you know, we might have some weaknesses and then to be able to work with my colleagues to address those issues. That for me is very rewarding. Um, and so personally, I, I count that as a win. Absolutely. Victoria? 
So um, my, okay, let's start with uh, my best. Um, so um, being in a foreign service, when I was in Algeria, um, there was an opportunity to go to Madagascar for the election. And um, some of us have kids, y'all. <laughs> it's life. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> so um, in Madagascar election observation, and um, when I got to Madagascar at first, I remember the team was somewhat surprised when I showed up because they had sent someone to the airport to pick me up and they have a sign that says my name and here I am after 40 hours of travel from Algeria to Madagascar, same continent, not easy to travel at all. Um, so after about 40 hours of travel and they're like double checking that I'm this person that Embassy Algier sent for election observation. And I'm like, yes, here's my passport. I believe I need a diplomatic visa. Um, and then showing up in the embassy the next day, you know, excited to be a part of this leadership, see what they're, what's going on, offer some insights from Algiers because we were gonna do the same thing a year later when Algeria had elections and I would, I ended up leading that as well. Um, I remember having to hold my ground pretty firm, seeing people visibly doubt you because I mean, yes, I'm younger, yes, I'm a woman, yes, I'm a person of color. So you have, I have all those three things kind of going against me when a lot of my colleagues aren't like that. <laughs> um, and that kind of fits in with the worst. Um, just how people will doubt you. I remember um, some people would kind of be amazed at some of the things I would say and say, oh, wow, like, oh, okay. Oh, but, but you're a fellow. So you, you went to a good grad school. And I'm like, no, I just am educated. <laughs> um, and proving to people what you're capable of. And, you know, eventually I led the embassy's mission um, to monitor elections, which, you know, as a first row officer, I was younger than all of my colleagues. Um, it was a pretty big deal. Thank you. So we have some, um, we're coming up at the end of our time, but let's talk about how to help people prepare. You've got undergraduates who are thinking, I think I want to apply for X fellowship. So if you registered, when you registered for this event, you received a series of links about many of these programs, but quickly, let's start with FLAS and then Shanika, why don't you speak for, um, for Pickering and Wrangell, please. Yeah, so if you want to do FLAS, I would say do your research first on the um, institution that you want to do FLAS with, because really depending on, you know, the program that you're looking at. So, for example, GW, um, it only apply the academic year fellowship is only for graduate students of two, two programs within the Elliott School, and that's the um, Seeker Center for Asian Studies and the, um, the name escapes me, but it's the uh, one for the myth for Middle Eastern studies. So if you don't fall into one of those categories or study one of the six languages listed, which are um, Arabic, Persian, Hebrew, Turkish, Japanese, Mandarin, and Korean, then, um, you know, FLAS really isn't an option. Um, you also have to look at uh, schools that might not match, you know, between how many tuition credits you want to take and, you know, the gap that you have to fill for the rest of your uh, time in your in, at school. Um, so that's my first point of call, do your research. Um, and just if you're interested in language at all in doing area studies, then go for it. You'll never really know unless you try. And I think like it's super worth it to not have to pay for an entire year of graduate school or a summer intense program if that's what you want to do. Just just do it is, is my other uh, piece of advice. So if you're interested in the Pickering or the Wrangell Fellowship, the first thing I would say is definitely look up and know the 13 dimensions of the Foreign Service. I think that is extremely important if you're interested. And um, what I would personally do is definitely look at those um, 13 dimensions and just sort of develop maybe like one or two examples of how you've demonstrated those dimensions. All right. Second thing is to really work on and develop your writing skills. Writing is so important. And if you want to become a foreign service officer with the US Department of State, you have to have strong writing skills. And you can do that now. Maybe it's taking that professor that always assigns all these different types of writing assignments. I know it'd be a lot now, but you know, you pay for, you know, you pay for it now, but you read 
reap the benefits later. So definitely develop your writing skills. Um, definitely stay on top of the news. Um, read, you know, The Economist, Foreign Policy, you know, The New York Times, those types of um, publications. Um, when you're eligible to um, apply for the fellowships, definitely start early. Definitely um, think about who you want to write your recommendations and let them know in advance so they have time to prepare for that. Also, definitely utilize the resources at your institution. From, for a lot of people here, it's GW. So definitely check out the Career Services Center and definitely have some people that you trust, you know, look over um, um, your application materials so that you can be the strongest um, candidate when you're applying for these um, um, fellowships. And continue to um, look at um, different ways where you can gain um, just different experiences. Um, I attended um, Howard University and, and I was a resident assistant while I was there. And I realized that a lot of the things I did as a resident assistant, you know, translated into the, it translated directly into the 13 dimensions of the Foreign Service. And I used a lot of that those types of examples when I was going for my foreign service oral exam and going for the fellowship. Um, so definitely um, start um, finding opportunities where you can demonstrate the 13 dimensions of the foreign service. Uh, you know, there's a future for you in recruitment. Um, thank you really for, for making that point. So the State Department, the 13 foreign service dimensions are um, what the State Department decided about 25, 30 years ago, 28 years ago, we took a long look at ourselves and said, if we had to build a perfect foreign service employee, what would that look like? And so there are 13 dimensions that um, really any employer would want, but they are key to foreign service life. But so these are the dimensions, these are the things that we're looking for. We don't make you read tea leaves. We tell you right up front, we're looking for people who can convey these 13 foreign service traits written communication, oral communication, um, synthesizing information, your judgment, okay? For goodness sakes, your judgment. So familiarizing yourself with what they are is going to help you understand what is the State Department looking for? But then you're not done because once you're in the Foreign Service, the, the Foreign Service precepts, that's every year when our um, evaluations are written, they are based on those 13 Foreign Service dimensions also. So really I, I spend a lot of my time as a recruiter talking with people, um, there's a sense of kind of entitlement. I've done all the right things. I've gone to the right school. I've taken the right major. I've got this degree and I, I'm not getting through to the foreign service. Let me tell you, I don't know if you've seen the commercial. What is it? Um, the shingles doesn't care. So the state department doesn't care how you acquired those 13 dimensions. It doesn't matter. I don't care what school you went to, State Department doesn't care what school you went to, so long as you can convey them. There is not a mechanism in our entry process, either through the fellowships or otherwise, to account for an actual academic credential. It just isn't there. Yolanda has a doctorate, State Department doesn't care. So in the end, you have to make sure however you got them. If you work in hospitality, I was a waitress for three days exactly, the world's worst. You talk about multitasking, people are hangry, they can get rude, all of that. However you have acquired those 13 dimensions, you need to be able to go forward and, and make that case. I'm the child of a funeral director. Uh, I had a mortician in my A100 class. You talk about people who have cultural adaptability, burial traditions vary from culture to culture all the time, religion to religion. This is someone who has to be able to navigate that on a daily basis. We don't care how you got those 13 dimensions, but you have to be able to convey them. Do not take this lightly and please don't try to game this process. We have seen it all before. So I wanna give Hannah the opportunity to, I know that we are coming up at the end of our time, uh, address any questions that may be left over in the chat or folks who are writing you directly. And I think our panel is willing to hang on a little longer if you have questions specifically for them and things that we haven't covered. Yeah, so I'll actually turn it over to Kelsey. Um, she's on our events team who's going to be, I guess, moderating the short Q&A as we do the end of our event. Sure. Yes, yeah, so as our event kind of winds down, we just wanted to open up the panel for anyone who has questions in the audience for any of our panelists about like their specific fellowship program or their career path in general. Uh, 
Oh, everyone's shy. Y'all can free, like, feel free to put it in the chat or raise your hand and unmute yourself. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, um, I just had a question for Ashley. Like, I know that you mentioned that you worked um, in the Peace Corps. So if, like, how did that experience help you uh, to get where you are now? And then like, how was that experience just at all? Absolutely. So Peace Corps was so instrumental in helping to develop me into the person that I am today. And so you'll notice within USA, there are so many foreign service officers and civil service um, officers who are former Peace Corps volunteers. And so with that experience, you really get to witness and partake in grassroots development. It's really about connecting with um, people in your community, people on the ground who are living these issues that you know USAID is trying to address every single day. And so being able to gain that insight into what things really look like on the ground versus what they might look like at the policy level is super instrumental in ensuring that you can do development better and ensuring that we can program development to be more sustainable. Um, so I honestly think that my time in the Peace Corps was some of the most transformative uh, years of my life and I'm very grateful for the experience and I'm happy to speak more about uh, my experience and more about the Peace Corps if like on the side if you would like to send me an email I'm happy to speak with you. Yeah go ahead Joshua. Um, yeah so I just want to thank all the panelists again you know just for meeting with us and giving us all this you know useful information. So I just wanted to ask, um, so I'm just like now switching my major like to international affairs. I'm just curious about how you all, um, like it's such a broad field. So I was curious about how you all determine exactly what you all wanted to do when you in your careers and as well as like, what advice would you give to us who are just now, you know, entering like the field of um, I. Um, I have an answer. Um, so advice that was given to me at my Pickering interview when I asked a similar question um, was study what you're passionate about. Um, it's great, you know, for your resume to put, you know, you study international affairs or something like that. But if you like sociology or if you like biology, study it because you're going to do well in the things that you're passionate about. And from that, you'll build the skills necessary for the foreign service. And as Shaniqua mentioned, it doesn't matter where you get those experiences from for those 13 dimensions. As long as you can show those 13 dimensions and show that you have you know, writing skills, um, communication skills, leadership skills, those types of skills, as long as you do well in what you study, that's what's most important. And that's what I did when I was studying I, in undergrad. I, did politics, economics, and Middle Eastern studies. And my master's, I was first enrolled in the international affairs program, but then I was actually more interested in the security policy studies program and their classes. And I switched from international affairs to security policy where I focus more on nuclear policy, which I haven't used so far in the foreign service. Um, hopefully I use in the future, but it was something I was more passionate about. Joshua, can I tell you, I'm so happy that you asked the question because I'll use myself as an example, undergrad um, and grad music history and literature, because I was certain I wanted to be a music historian and I was, but when it comes to cultural affairs, when we start talking about things like, you know, how exactly are we gonna communicate with people in ways that resonate? I can't tell you how many times I've been pulled in like Yolanda, what should we do for, yeah. So I'm pleased to be able to provide that, that feedback to my colleagues because policy is one thing but policy is dead and, you know until it comes alive and actually does something is it may as well just be a paper a white paper my doctoral studies are a little more aligned it's a religious studies um largely peace and conflict um but again it's on the cultural side religious institutions are cultural institutions and so when you're looking at things like elections uh what the churches are doing domestically and overseas is really gonna is really going to play into what the political realities are on the ground. So whatever it is that you love, do it because there's no part of diplomacy that and development that that will not touch on any subject. So even if it's in STEM, our econ officers, our environment, science, technology, health officers. So 
if it doesn't even seem like, wait a minute, is there, can I really use this? Absolutely. We have lots of people in the hard sciences that end up uh, in the State Department. So don't put yourself through something that you hate um, just because you know, you're thinking that that's, that's the, the magic ticket. Do what you love. I promise you everything else will follow. Well, thank you. For our panelists, we have a question in the chat, the best way to reach all of you guys. So if you guys feel comfortable, just put any mode of communication for anyone interested in reaching out to you who are potentially interested in your fellowship program. And then are there any other questions? So there was a, a link in the registration to um, how do you find your diplomat in residence? I cover DC, uh, Maryland, Delaware, Northern Virginia, and West Virginia. Uh, but if that is not uh, where you're from or where your school is, then there's a link so you can find who your diplomat in residence is. Um, they're all really wonderful people. We are domestically here to provide you with accurate information about joining the Foreign Service. So. I know what the subreddit says. Yes, I've looked at some of that stuff and it horrifies me, a lot of it. But get the accurate information, please, from your diplomat and residents. And then before we close our event tonight, I actually have a question for our panelists too. So because I know a lot of us in this um, Zoom call are undergraduate students, so I was just curious, like throughout the duration of your fellowship program when you were in grad school or are currently in grad school, how do you get the most out of grad school in your opinions? Can I jump in on that one? So for me, I always like to talk about imposter syndrome. And I know not everybody experiences it, but I know for myself, I experienced it in some of the worst ways. And so when it comes to getting the most out of your graduate experience, just remember that imposter syndrome is completely, it's all made up. Like it's not even a real thing, right? Like you deserve to be in those rooms and in those spaces and you deserve these opportunities just as much, if not more than your peers. So always remind yourself that, you know, at the end of the day, this imposter syndrome that I'm feeling is not real. It's a figment of my imagination and I deserve this. So don't let that hinder um, you from taking chances. Don't let it hinder you from, you know, expressing and expressing yourself and, and showing up as your most authentic self. I'd like to jump in here. So um, depending on what program you're going for, so I'm currently in the second year of my master's program and two years is really short compared to undergrad. Like you can do a lot of things in undergrad. You know, you, you think you have a lot of time in grad school. Like you have that same semblance going in and then you're at the end of it like I am and you're just like, what did I even do? So definitely, one time management skills please build up your time management skills because you will have a lot to do in a short amount of time and to really make the most of it you have to understand where you can properly allocate your energy for things and be realistic about it like if you know you have to read 600 pages a week for four classes then maybe you shouldn't be you know signing up for like three extracurriculars because it's not feasible if that's something you can do by all means do it right so this semester alone i had um, three classes, including my capstone project to graduate, uh, a part-time job, an internship, leading a student organization. And I did all that because I was scheduling it, but also because I knew that I was making all of these connections with people from, you know, through my FLAS fellowship, like my language teacher introduced me to um, my former boss who I did an MC event, uh, MC thing with. And then that work ended up helping me in my own graduate research. And then that graduate research ended up helping me get an internship at the think tank of my dreams, Center for Strategic and International Studies. And that internship is helping me to gain footing in the entire policy world in Japan. Like you never know, you know, who you talk to and what experiences that you can just say yes to if you have the time, where that will lead you. And I think that's really important to keep in mind as you go through graduate school. I, and I just want to add one thing, definitely take advantage of the things that are offered at your university. So again, I talked about the Career Services Center. I was up in there like all the time. I, you know, I got my resume critiqued. I got, you know, my statement of interest critiqued. I mean, I was just doing everything up in there. I really enjoyed that. 
also at GW, the library offers, um, you know, things on like how to get better at photo, Photoshop and all these other different things. Like you could definitely gain skills by going to the library. So like definitely utilize everything that, you know, your um, university has to offer. Um, we have a question in the chat and this is probably best to be directed for Dr. Kearney um, talking about the 13 dimensions and how young officers especially have developed them. For instance, management, judgment, do you have anything to add to that? Right, so um, the 13 dimensions are, we recruit for those. So you need to come to this process um, ready to show, to convey that you have mastered those 13. So um, for um, FAST officers, first and second tour officers, uh, when you join the Foreign Service, you should know that you have five years to achieve tenure. So those first five years or, or until you achieve tenure is really like a test drive, right? Um, are you going to make it? So um, one of the things you have to do is to come off language uh, probation. There's a consular uh, tour um, requirement as well. So those first two tours are meant to set up officers for success. It's part of the reason why they are directed towards, meaning that we are going to do the research for you. And there are positions that are set aside at embassies and consulates specifically for FAST officers so that you can um, achieve tenure. So you can get off probation and language probation so that you can get your requirements done and get the, acquire the skills that you need. So the trade craft you're going to learn at the Foreign Service Institute. We're not gonna send you out, yay, I'm an econ officer, so I'm just gonna go off and, and talk about microeconomics in whatever country. No, we're gonna teach you tradecraft, we're gonna teach you language. But the 13 dimensions, if you notice, none of that is really about classroom learning. Yes, you can work on your written communication, that's true. But things like judgment, um, initiative, those are things that are really sort of innate. And so uh, there's not really a way necessarily to, um, to develop those uh, as a person, except through your experiences. So again, um, take a look at the 13 and you'll see that there's not really a class necessarily on X thing. There's not a class on judgment. Um, there are classes on written communication or oral communication, that's true. But generally we're looking for people who are able to convey those. But for officers, once you're in, yeah, certainly your trade craft and your experiences at post are part of the things that are going to set you up for um, further promotions as, as you go uh, further along in your career. So the beginning of your career as, um, as a political officer, for example, is not at all the same as what it is in the middle of your career or at the end. And also each tour is different in different places and at different times. So someone who served as a public affairs officer in the Congo uh, 10 years before me did not have anything like what I had with three Ebola outbreaks and three evacuations. Um, likewise, uh, the State Department and USAID, we're looking for officers who can be magnificent wherever they are. So I'm of little, little use to the State Department if I am fantastic in London, but I fall apart in Bangui. So all of that is that goes into um, the development of officers, but those 13 dimensions are not specific to officers when they come in. We want you to come to the table ready to show us how you already have those. And could you explain further what language probation means? Yes, so language mastery, Cassidy knows about this, language mastery and acquisition are major parts of our career. So while you don't have to come to um, the State Department or USAID, uh, depending, with a language, you're going to be taught a language. And so obviously the expectation is if we teach you that language, that you're going to have the ability to master it and you're going to have the ability to, um, to maintain it. So, um, and you don't have forever to do it, right? I went to my first tour, I, I did not have any French at all. I had Spanish and German when I came to the Foreign Service, but I had 26 weeks to do it. Anyone can learn a language if you have two years or so, like, oh, I can learn French in two years, but you don't. You, um, someone is going to leave your office in that seat on X date, and they're expecting you to come and fill that seat on X date with the language that you have acquired, with, this, with the tradecraft you've acquired. So being able to acquire languages and to master them and maintain them are major parts of this, of this process. And so um, we're not expecting you to bring it, um, to come to the, the Foreign Service with it, but once we teach you a language, your expectation is it's your full-time job for however long it takes, eight hours a day, plus evenings, weekends, and homework. So you acquire that language. So that's what that is. Okay, and then our last question for our panelists is, 
They're asking between a grad program or school that is better known for its prestige versus another one that has less of a reputation, but you're really drawn to the curriculum, which one would you recommend? So I'll take a shot at that one. Um, I, you would have to balance it. I mean, if you're choosing, like aim as high as you can go, right? Like apply to Ivy League, apply to like the top 15, the top 20 and all that. Um, so if you're in like that range, then they're all good schools, ideally, you know, it doesn't matter. Um, it, it, what the name is on your resume, as long as you do well. So you would opt for the curriculum. So you have courses you enjoy instead of, you know, forcing yourself to take a class you don't like. But let's say you are drawn to a, maybe a more local school that many people won't know. Again, it's on you. Um, I would probably still say to choose one with the curriculum you like, because you can also make your education um, what you need out of it too. Um, you could see, you could search for um, like research programs with other scholars who might not necessarily be at your school, but if you're doing well in your courses because you're interested in them, you could say, hey, I'm like a, I'm like a straight A student in my courses so far. I have like a, this high of a GPA and I, I seek another opportunity um, because sometimes you might go to like Harvard and not enjoy your classes, not do well and not get further opportunity. Very true. All right, so I, I know we've gone over the hours. So I'm just gonna close our event for now, but I would like to have a special thanks to all of our guests and attendees for this event, and also to all of our panelists, and of course our moderator, Dr. Kearney. I am going to drop all the information for YBPAA that you can use to help connect with our organization. And also there's going to be a recording of this event posted to our YouTube later on. And so thank you all for attending and we hope to see you all again soon.